ada yang saya uh, saya di, di, diikat pakai anu yang diikat pakai kawat itu ada ada di sini ya yang bang nuar di cek kawat diikat di situ tolong di anu Yan aku suruh dia ngelihat ya dia suruh lihat 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 Yan tidur dia tidur oh tidur Yan lihat lihat ada gana apa dibunuh Yan mari lihat apa disiksa lihat apa dipukul berdarah darah sini mi ini sini ah lihat 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 apa dipukul ya kasih suara ya betul ya ini memberikan bantuan tak tak mau Enggak lah, enggak apa-apa ya ini. Apa maksud kau? Apa maksud kau? Apa maksud kau? Hah? Hei. Enggak. Dalam film ini harus dilihat ya. Apa maksud kau? Ampun, Bang. Sedih apa ya ini? Sedih 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 ya ini? Ini apa yang dipukul ya Bang Gemuk? Pukul ya Bang Gemuk ini sama Bang Sapit. Kalau apa bocor-bocor. Bocor-bocor. Ngomong, ngomong. Bang, jangan, Bang. Iya, iya. Iya, jangan. Tapi kau ngomong, ngomong, ngomong. Kau harus pakai semua apa yang kau buat di badan ini. Sekarang kau panggil, apa yang kau panggil sekarang? Ayo, kau jawab apa yang kau pertanyakan. Apakah orang yang ku siksa dulu itu rasanya seperti aku begini? Ah itulah dia. Jelaskan. Tapi aku dapat merasakan ya perasaan mereka yang disiksa. Karena jelas ya di sini ini apa namanya marwah habis, harga diri kayak kehabisan, semua rasa takut itu datang. Pas waktu begini, nimbrung dia sekalian memasuki dalam tubuh itu, bang, nimbung sekalian masuk dalam tubuh. Jelas apa yang dirasakan orang yang disiksa Bang Noir jauh-jauh jauh lebih buruk dari ini Karena Bang Noir tahu ini hanya film Mereka tahu bahwa mereka akan dibunuh Tapi saya merasakan ya Benar-benar saya rasakan Atau saya mungkin Saya itu Apa dosa sama saya Banyak ya, ya manusia yang pernah saya begini gitu ya. Apakah ini, ini kembali dia kepada saya? Mudah-mudahan jangan sampai, jangan, nggak mau saya ya, saya begini ya.
こうだよ難しいとこだねこれねいいとか悪いとかできたできないっていうんじゃないなこれあいつのシンクいつくね、基本的に言うとデーモンデーモンに引きずられていくものがあるわけよアーティストっていうのはもうストップしてできないんだよね本当はストップした方がいいなと頭狂ったし女房は逃げていくし子供はなあの家出する人自分はないんだよもうだから自分だからいらないんだよドローンストライクスは増えていた。ドローンストライクスは増えていた。ドローンストライクスは増えていた。ドローンストライクスは増えていた。ドローンストライクスは増えていた。ドローンストライクスは増えていた。ドローンストライクスは増えていた。
Mogadishu was seeing its worst fighting in years, and there were no foreign journalists left in the city. My local contact, Bashir Osman, was worried about my safety. Okay. Okay. It was a strange feeling, traveling with a dozen armed men in a decoy car. I still had my reporter's notebook, but what could I learn in conditions like these? Before arriving in Somalia, I'd read reports that the U.S. was outsourcing the kill list to local warlords. Among the most powerful in Mogadishu was Yusuf Mohammed Siad, known by everyone as Indaade, White Eyes. In an earlier life, Indaade had been America's enemy offering protection to people on the U.S. kill list. But the warlord had since changed sides. He was now on the U.S. payroll and assumed the title of general. So he's saying that the fiercest fighting that they're doing right now is happening right here. Okay. The men fired across the rooftops, but it didn't make sense to me what we were doing here, or what the Americans were doing here, in Somalia, arming this warlord turned general for what seemed like a senseless war. We gotta move. So these were Shabab fighters yeah. you buried here? If you capture a foreigner alive, you execute them on the battlefield? How did the Americans find men like Inda Ade? And to what end? After a decade of covert war, Somalia was in ruins. Half the country was ruled by the local Al-Qaeda affiliate, the other half by men like the general, wandering the streets with an endless kill list and a band of men. Every time we stopped, people looked at us nervously and I was told that my very presence was endangering them. Bashir would insist we leave moments after we arrived. I wanted to see beneath the surface of the war, to understand what it meant to ordinary Somalis. But I was passed from warlord to warlord, and soon realized the only people I'd be able to meet were men with guns. You know, when you are fighting with enemy, any option is open. No mercy. For years, Mohamed Kanyare was Washington's man in Mogadishu. His methods were extreme, but Washington insisted Kanyare's services were vital to their kill campaign. Who were the people that the Americans wanted your help tracking? No, no I don't want to talk. You don't want to talk about that? I don't. Hmm. Did they offer to fund any operations? Yeah, uh, that one also, uh, no comment. You don't want to comment on that? No comment. But you're targeting people for the Americans? Yes, we will arrest and interrogate and release if they have no, uh, we'll not seen nothing. That's our business. And when these American operations kill innocent people, what's the impact? America knows war. They are war masters. They know better than me. So when they funded the war, they know how to fund it. They, they don't need even to touch, to tell them. They know very well. They are teachers, great teachers. نزلت الشارع 
ولما نزلت الشارع لقيت كل اللي حواليا ما يقلوش عني اي حاجة كلهم زي حاولوا يفرقونا باي شكل وباي طريقة الشعب غضب وكفر الخوف خاف على انا مش خاف على نفسي انا خاف عليك انت خاف عليك انت من اللي جاي والدنيا كلها نزلت انزل ولا حتى الناس دي اللي, اللي نايمه في الخرا عشان نفسك وعشان عيالك وعشان اهلك وعشان تعرف تعيش أتوجه بحديث اليوم لشباب مصر بميدان التحرير أتوجه إليكم جميعا بحديث من القلب حديث الأب لأبنائه وبناته إنني أعتز بكم رمزا لجيل مصري جديد يدعو إلى التغيير إلى الأفضل ويتمسك به إن مصر تجتاز أوقاتا صعبة وينتهي بمصر الأمر لأوضاع يصبح معها الشباب الذين دعوا إلى التغيير والإصلاح أول المتضررين منها الشعب كله انفجر مرة واحدة عشان يحاربوا الظلم والفساد والفقر والمرض والجه وكل اللي عدى علينا من أيام صودة في خلال الثلاثين سنة كلهم زي كلهم نفس النسخة أقسمت بالله مش همشي من ميدان ولا همشي من المكان ده الا ما تتحقق كل حاجه انا قابلت مجد عاشور في الميدان مجد عاشور هو احد اعضاء الاخوان المصريين خالد عبد الله مصري كان مولود بره بس رجع مصر تاني وقرر انه ما يسيبهاش. عايدة. رامع صار. كان مشهور بلقب مطرب الصور حبينا بعض من غير ما نحس. مسلم أو مسيحي كلنا كنا موجودين كنا إيد واحدة إيد واحدة إيد واحدة إيد واحدة إيد واحدة إيد واحدة أنا هتكلم ونملى الدنيا بالأشعار وتقف الكلمة في الميتان وتضرب وسط ضرب النار هنتكلم ثورة ثورة حتى النص ثورة ثورة حتى النص ثورة كل وهنا عرفنا ان الشعب هو السلطه الحقيقيه 
couldn't sleep. I was getting in such a depressed state. I called my mother and father, asked them if they would take care of my kids. And the most enjoyment I got back in those days was singing in church. That's the only place that I was actually singing during those, those times. The only thing I thought I could do and make a little money to survive, you know, I started cleaning houses. Not the great Darlene Love. She's not doing cleaning houses. I said, yes, the great Darlene Love is. She is cleaning houses. One particular Christmas, I was cleaning this lady's bathroom. And Christmas baby, please come home. My Christmas record came on the radio while I was cleaning this bathroom. And I just looked up and just said, okay, all right, darling, this is not where you're supposed to be. You're supposed to be singing. There's a whole world out there who wants to hear you sing. And then the move from California to New York, my career just took off. Be here with me. Thanks for being here. Everything okay with you? Everything is wonderful. Thanks for being here. Come back and sing it again next year. Of course. I hope you have a good holiday. <laughs> I have to plan what I'm going to do. I have to take little jobs. Just so you can keep your name out there. But if I didn't do those jobs, then nobody would really know who Darling Love was. As a young person, I thought everybody could sing. When you start getting older, then you realize everyone is not a singer and that these are gifts. And you have to share and go out into the world. What a wonderful group. What an amazing film. I mean, each one of them for me was hit so many different tender and horrific places as I watch them. And it makes me even more curious to see who all of you are and why you did these films. So why don't you start, you two start, introduce yourself, tell me why you did a film within a film and tell me the story of the film and also how you two work together. Well, I'm Joshua Oppenheimer. I'm the director of The Act of Killing. And <laughs> no, I'm Sine Sansen. I'm, I'm the producer of The Act of Killing. And thank you all for coming. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you to my fellow filmmakers. You're all so wonderful. Um, I began making this film actually in collaboration with the survivors of the 1965-66 genocide in 2003. We were trying to make a film together about why they are afraid, about what it's like for them to live with the perpetrators all around them still in positions of power, and consequently what it's like for them to live today with the fear that this could happen to them again at any time. When we began that process, the army found out what we were doing and told the, threatened the survivors that they mustn't continue with the film. The survivors told me I was living with them. They said, look, before you quit, before you give up, before you go home, try to film the perpetrators. They may tell you how they killed our relatives. I didn't know if it was safe to approach the perpetrators at all, but when I did, I found to my horror that all of them were open and immediately boastfully recounting the most awful details of the killings with smiles on their faces in front of their families and even their small grandchildren. And I had this awful feeling that I'd wandered into Germany 40 years after the Holocaust only to find the Nazis still in power and implicated because I knew my own government had enthusiastically supported the genocide when it had happened and supported the regime that, was put into, that, that came to power through it. I showed this early material with, this, with the perpetrators to those survivors who wanted to see it, and then to the broader Indonesian human rights community, and everyone who saw it said, you're on to something so important, keep filming the perpetrators. Because anyone who sees this anywhere in the world will finally be forced to acknowledge the rotten heart of this regime that the killers have built. 
I then felt entrusted by those survivors in the human rights community to do a work that clearly they could not do themselves. I spent, uh, safely anyways, I spent two years filming every perpetrator I could find across North Sumatra. The main character who you saw in the film, Anwar Congo, was the 41st perpetrator I filmed at the end of that two year period. And all of them were boastful, all of them were eager to show me what they'd done, eager to, eager to take me to the places where they killed, La they would launch into spontaneous demonstrations of how they killed, and to understand really why, how they want to be seen, how they see themselves. I started to propose to them very openly, look, you've participated in one of the biggest killings in human history. I want to know what it means to you and to your society. You want to show me what you've done. So go ahead and show me what you've done in whatever way you wish. I will help you film your reenactments, but I will also film you and your fellow Death Squad veterans discussing what you want to show and equally what you want to leave out because that way we can show what this means to you, what this means to your society, and somehow, uh, how, if we can show, I knew that if we could show how they want to be seen, how they see themselves, that the whole facade, that this was heroic, would come crumbling down. But you also had really a strike of luck because Anwar really loved movies and loved film, and so maybe you could talk about that because I think that was a big segue for you to get accepted and for him to understand what was happening. Yeah, when I was proposing this method, I mean, in saying that I will help you re-dramatize what you've done in whatever way you wish, and I will, but I will also film the process, it is, of course, implied that there is no film within the film. There's no second film that they're making that has any life. They're only making scenes for the act of killing. And also that the method was an, a, a response to their openness, not a trick to get them to open up. But when I reached the city, of, I worked my way up the chain of command from the countryside to the city. When I reached the city, I found that the army recruited its killers from the ranks of gangsters who hung out in movie theaters and in fact called themselves movie theater gangsters. And they would sell tickets on the black market. And then I gradually started to hear that they would Get, get, get methods of killing from movies. Free men. Yeah, mm -hmm. and they would call themselves free men, which was actually, is in fact the, the word for gangster in Indonesian comes from the word preman, is preman, which comes from free men. But they somehow identified this word free men with this sort of ideal of freedom that they'd encountered in American movies, and in particular gangster movies. And they would talk about coming out of movies what, what most vividly an Elvis Presley musical, Anwar talks about, dancing his way across the street and killing happily. So movies and fantasy were somehow involved with allowing him to do what he did, allowing him to distance himself from the act of killing while he was killing. Uh, the, the method, I didn't expect that we would come to these elaborate, genre-inspired, surreal dramatizations. That evolved organically as Anwar would watch the scenes we shot and clearly disturbed by the content, would not dare to acknowledge really what was bothering him. He would never dare to say this is awful because to say that would be to do something he'd never been forced to do, which would, would be to admit what he did was wrong. And so instead he would propose, he would present as an improvement. He would lie to himself and lie to me and say, we can, if we can only fix the costumes, or fix the genre, or fix the lighting, or my hair, we or improve our acting, maybe we can, we can put this right. And I think he was trying, in fact, to, 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 to he was trying somehow to, to make it right for himself by making it better in the movie. And in that sense, what was fueling the journey, I think, for him the whole time was somehow his conscience, and maybe it's not so surprising in hindsight that the fictional reenactments become this kind of prism through which he finally acknowledges the horror of, of, of what he's done. But also, too, why aren't there some lines in the film where um, communists would come to him and say, thank you for taking my life and giving him a medal? And Yeah, actually, we had, we had, not, we had wanted to show the scene that came just before what you watched, but it was too long. And it is um, Anwar, in response to the growing sense of remorse that he feels, or, or trauma that he starts to feel, proposed stages his own kind of bogus and dishonest redemption in heaven, in this grandiose musical number, Born Free, in a waterfall with dancing girls. And in, the, in heaven, he's greeted by his dead victims who thank him for killing 
them and sending them to heaven. And he watches it, it seems at first delighted, saying it's so powerful, it's so moving. But in reality, it offers him no real solace because it is a lie. And the very next line he says, and where the clip we, we saw began, he said, the very next line he says is, okay, yes, but what about the scene where I kill, where I'm strangled with wire? Because I think somehow he was making this film to somehow deal with and run away from that, that basic horror. Would you like to add to this and also your role in the film and what you come away with it? And I know that you guys are doing another film together, which is the exact opposite. Yeah. When, when I first met Joss, I'm, I'm based in Denmark, um, and Joss was based in, in London. Um, and I saw one of these very first clips with perpetrators, we call it the river walk, where one was, it was two perpetrators and one was playing himself as a perpetrator and the other one was playing the victims and they were t t dragging each other down to the river and showing how they killed. And I thought this is so incredibly important that this kind of story must get a wider audience. And, and that was my sort of first in, involvement. I, I contacted Joss and we, s we started talking. And, uh, and we made it into this international collaboration. Of course, it just was already working with this hu huge group of Indonesian filmmakers. So they, they are the core of, of that group. And then on top of that came uh, filmmakers in Denmark and filmmakers in Norway and England as well. So it, it's a collaborative affair. Well, seen as the most patient, brave, wonderful producer on planet Earth, and that may in fact mean in the universe, <laughs> for all we know. So no, it was, it was mean, more than just a... Yeah, but we, we, um, we've worked together since 2007, and uh, we are also now working on a second film about the survivors, and it's, it's a, in, in a way we see these two films as a pair. We've always wanted to do both perspectives on this story. And, and we hope to bring this other story out as throughout sometime this year. Can you talk a little bit more about doing this film on the survivors? And is this difficult for you now that this film is out? And can you go back to Indonesia? Or maybe you yeah. can't come out of Indonesia? <laughs> or no, we, we, <laughs> we actually shot this second film, uh, or the, the last part of that, before we brought out The Act of Killing. We, because we knew that there was a good chance that we probably couldn't go back. And then we have been editing in between all this, this work of bringing the act of killing out. And now we are, we are sort of making ready, we wanna uh, go and show it for the family who are the main characters in this film. And, and they need to see it, all of them, and, and we have to discuss it with them how to bring it out. And then we will do the sound and the color correction and all that and, and get it out. It's a film about a, f a family of survivors with whom I began this journey many a decade ago, more or less, more than a decade. They find out who killed their son through the first 40 perpetrators I filmed and then decide that they, are, that they want to break the silence that the family's been sort of forced to live under and confront all of the men involved with killing their son. It's unimaginable in Indonesia for that to happen. That's why we have to handle the release very carefully. But mm. it's turned into a kind of poem about this silence born of terror and the necessity, but also the trauma that comes with breaking that silence. Mm. One of the most startling things in your film is near the end when Anwar goes up to a spot where he has been doing a lot of killing and maybe you could explain what he was doing. It's, it, it just shook me. Yeah, it actually is the scene that follows this, this clip we've just seen. So you've asked about the one right before and the <laughs> one right after. <laughs> well, um, that must be Anwar, good, at the right? end, Exactly, at the end of a five-year journey <laughs> of filming, we filmed, I filmed with Anwar and, his, and the men around him over a, for five years. Um, 1,200 hours of material we filmed together, but the very next scene I filmed with Anwar after this scene was actually six months later in time. I went home and came back, and I, had been, I took him back up to the rooftop where he, where he took me the first day I met him, and where he showed me how he killed and, had, and then danced the cha-cha-cha in the spot where he killed people. And he says, and I, I wanted to take him back because I'd never been able to get back there and I had heard all these 
awful stories the first day I'd been there, but we then couldn't get access again to that space. I wanted to bring him back and have him just say, this happened here, we did this here, we did this here, because these were stories we'd spent five years dramatizing and dealing with. We walk up to the roof, and Anwar's trying to do exactly what I've asked him to do, and suddenly he's sort of uh, attacked by this kind of, uh, racked by this sort of bout of retching, this physical, re reaction to what happened what he's what he's experienced there and then the what it what it's meant for him and it was one of these awful awful moments where i had this feeling that he's trying to vomit up the ghosts that haunt him and i wanted to put my my arm uh, only that nothing would come up because what haunts him is somehow his past and we are our pasts so what haunts him he is the ghost that haunts him I wanted to do this thing that we in our Americans do in our eternal, delightful, and ultimately misguided optimism, which is to put my arm around him and say, it's, it's going to be OK. And in that moment, of course, I knew this is not, this is what it looks like when it's really, really, really not, not, not OK. Yeah. Before we go on. Did you two change in any way from this experience? Uh, and also maybe talking about the anonymous people that mm -hmm. helped you, camera people. Yeah, the, the film was made in collaboration with a team of some 60 anonymous, 60 Indonesians. These were people who gave, some of them, eight years of their lives to make this film. Some of them changed their careers from being university professors, heads of human rights organizations. Um, to make the film because they felt it was that important, risking their safety, knowing that until there's real political change in Indonesia, they would not be able to take credit for their work. So the, really the film ends in the credit scroll where the screen fills with anonymous, 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 anonymous. One of them is my, was, my second, uh, was my production manager, my assistant director, my second camera person, but above all my main creative sounding board on the shooting. And that dialogue, I think, is responsible for this film having been embraced in Indonesia as a work of Indonesian cinema. And it's so important for the, for the impact of the film there and for its authenticity that I've credited him as a co-director. The saddest part of releasing the film is that he can't be with us tonight because it would be dangerous for him. Um, even though the film is helping to catalyze a transformation in how Indonesia is now talking about its past, just the question about how we've changed. I kind of am tempted to ask Sina how I've changed and vice versa, but I'll hazard a guess about myself and let <laughs> Sina do the same about herself. I guess I've, um, I've probably become more accepting, less willing to condemn or judge another human being as a whole, while utterly intolerant of any justification for harming others or for the ways in which we are all dependent on the suffering of others for our survival and our living. Yeah. 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 I think, I mean, I've learned an awful lot from working with Josh and from meeting these people and it's also working with all our Indonesian uh, crew members. Um, and I think the most important thing for me in terms of, of uh, the way we do our filmmaking is that that uh, doing this project has been uh, an enormous struggle. And the fact that we just continued and continued and continued and that it actually worked, it given a little bit more confidence that it is actually possible to bring a film like this out. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Zach and Lydia, can you tell who you are and really talk about the film Cutie and the Boxer and the themes of it and how you came to it and the relationship between the two artists? Because we really saw in the clips really the relationship of one artist and it's so much richer and it really speaks about marriage and competition and helping each other. Sure, I'm Zachary Heinzling, uh, director of Cutie and the Boxer. I'm Lydia Pilcher, producer. 
Thanks so much for having us here. It's been a real pleasure. Um, so I was introduced to the Shinaharas in 2008 uh, by a good friend of mine who's a photographer at the time. Um, so I'd only seen pictures and really knew nothing of, of their art um, or their history. Um, and I showed up at their loft one afternoon um, with a camera and Ushio was performing one of his boxing paintings. Um, and so here was this half-naked 80-year-old man hurling himself at a <laughs> canvas uh, with paint splashing everywhere. And it was kind of pure spectacle. Um, and Noriko, uh, his wife, was sort of off in the wings and, and um, making sort of sly comments along the way and, and saying things like, well, you know, I, I'm the one that chose the colors for this painting or, um, <laughs> you know, I'm the one that, that had the idea uh, for this painting. And there was this immediate tension and this immediate contrast. And, and at first I thought, well, what a, you know, beautiful sort of study in contrast. You had this sort of ar archetypal male character, um, you know, who she is termed bully. Um, <laughs> who is, uh, and, and, and is boxing, and is making sculptures of motorcycles, um, but happens to be quite short and, and, and slight. Um, and, you know, everything is about being brash and bold, and his act and his performance is his art. He, he sort of coined this term, action is art. And, um, and then his wife, uh, you know, sort of in some ways, opposite, you know, very self-reflective. Her art is all about her past. Um, Ushio is never, uh, never thinks about the past, and Noriko sort of lives in it. And um, her art, very precious and careful and, and beautiful and, and, you know, 60 years old and, and has pigtails uh, and this sort of platinum white hair. And it, there was so much just sort of on the surface to look at, um, and there was so much sort of inherent beauty and, and the kind of caricatures that, that they played um, that visually I thought, you know, it would be really interesting and I wouldn't have to explain much. I could kind of watch and sort of show, um, you know, how unique and impressive uh, they were. Um, but then it also was clear that these sort of archetypes that they played, you know, were much more complicated and, and that I could sort of chip away at them and sort of see how, you know, the two of them could kind of flip-flop and, and cutie and bully wasn't as, you know, simple as that. Um, and that was also, that was also clear. There was this clear uh, resentment that, that uh, Noriko would sort of, you know, it would sort of seethe in all of their conversations. Um, and I, I was wondering kind of where that resentment came from. And the answer and really the reason for making the film came in Norco's artwork, um, this series of comics called Cutie and Bully, um, in which she has created this alter ego of herself named Cutie. Um, and it really kind of chronicles uh, a few years early in their marriage um, where you see the pain and, and struggle it was for a woman, a 19 years old, who married um, Ushio, who's 21 years older than him, and, and became basically his assistant, manager, translator, cook, and everything else, um, and kind of gave up her aspirations to be an artist, um, you know, to service him. And um, and there was there was so much depth, obviously, to, to the history of the relationship, but also what was interesting was the kind of um, the way she had reconstructed the past in a kind of almost humorous way. And it became interesting to see where the line between her exaggeration of the past and where the truth actually was and where the truth was was in this sort of contemporary story where I was following them um, in, in their daily life and, and trying to figure out this kind of fundamental question of why these two people that seem to be arguing all of the time are still together after 40 years um, and what you know what it means to be in a in a relationship like this and and you know uh, themes of enduring love and creative sacrifice and and um how do we kind of figure out uh you know what what keeps two people together and and how complicated that could be so um those were all the kind of questions that came up as as I kind of went on this what ended up being a five year journey of of you know filming them and documenting this unconventional life.
Uh, but there was also so much more. There was drinking, there was their son, and that whole relationship. Maybe you could talk about that, and he's also sure. an artist. Yes, um, so Ushio really was more famous for his parties uh, than his artwork, really. Uh, he was sort of <laughs> this enfant terrible of the, of the 70s Soho art scene in New York, um, friends with Warhol, Rosenquist, and, and Rauschenberg, and, and uh, you know, it had this loft on, on Broadway where dancers and painters and photographers would come and um, you know, he would throw these parties and he, and he was a heavy drinker and um, uh, would entertain. Um, and alcohol, I think, became a crutch. I mean, he never was a successful, financially successful artist, um, you know, but was sort of known for, for his personality more than an art, more than his art. Um, and um, and he never really sold anything, right? Right. I mean, he's famous for sort of what he did in Japan before he moved to New York. And that work, unfortunately, isn't around because he left it on the street and it was never sort of preserved. Um, so there are a few pieces that are in museums and in Europe and all over Japan that, and he's you know written in the history books. But his work that he did in the New York, uh, it never sold for various reasons. Um, but actually, in the film, you discover that um, about 10 years before I met them, he, he stopped drinking. Um, and their relationship uh, shifted and softened as a result. Um, but where the, so the sun comes in is uh, Alex Shinohara is a, a brilliant artist and, um, you know, was raised in this environment that I described. I mean, I, you know, we, I, I, I shot a lot with Alex, though he plays a relatively small role in the film, but, um, you know, he would tell me things like, um, my parents would, would go out at night and I would stand at the top of the staircase in this giant scary loft with a wooden kindo sword um, to protect myself. Um, and you can just, you look in his eyes and you see, um, you know, uh, the sort of absence of, of you know, his, his parents and his youth and, and what that's done and, um, and how it's affected him as a person, how it's affected his artwork, how it's affected his relationship with his parents. Um, which is uh, you know obviously strained and and the real role I think um, is to really you know show the this the unfortunate sacrifice really that they chose to make in the pursuit of, of art and to really question whether that was worth it or not and to see the other side of the kind of the romance of you know when you think of 60s and 70s downtown art you think of what's created the the greatest works that live in in the Museum of Modern Art in New York but do you see what the toll was on their families? Do you see, um, you know, what what they had to do to sort of, um, you know, to, to make what what they wanted? And and so you see both sides. I think in in Noriko, you see Noriko's um, implicit also in in the, this sort of problematic upbringing of her child. So uh, you know, cutie and bully again. It's it's just chipping away at what we kind of define as the, the villain and, and the victim. Also, her art is pretty provocative. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yes, I mean, she... And she, also, too, when you showed him the film, yeah. he made some comments um, about the second half, which is showed all of her art in it, that that could have been cut. Uh. Yes, this, this, it's a great story. When I first showed them the film after them not seeing anything for five years, and, and in this film, I mean, it's a, you know the the my goal was really to make the most intimate and personal uh, film I could, and so that's why it took so long. But you know, there's a scene in which I follow Ushio into the shower, and he gets completely naked and walks in, and and he you know it was a point where he didn't think twice about the fact that there was a a tall white guy with a camera right next to him as he was showering. I mean, it, you know, it was that <laughs> level of, of, you know, of uh, yeah. comfort. Um, so I showed them the film and, and uh, turned the TV off, and Ushio was the first to stand up and ask, so this is a love story. Um, and I sort of said, well, well, in some ways, yes. And, and he grunted and w looked kind of disgusted. and. Um, 
you know, <coughs> Ushio is an egomaniacal artist, and he feels like he that this film was supposed to be about him, and this film was supposed to be a, about art um, and his art, um, and so he decided that it was boring and that I should cut the last 30 minutes, which is essentially the point in the film where Noriko kind of gains her due and um, and the role reversal kind of is completed. Um, and Noriko, though, on my behalf, argued, you know, uh, that everything that he said was completely wrong um, and the movie was playing out in front of us. Um, so, you know, she's really taken ownership of the film and... and uh, in a way that we had all hoped for, is sort of using it as, as fodder or another weapon in this eternal battle that they have uh, <laughs> with one another. And, and um, you know, it's really her story in a way. And I think um, Ushio has embraced that as, as he's seen the film um, countless times. And, and in a way, the kind of shift that was occurring is, is was just only galvanized as a result of, of the film and reaching an audience that that Ushio has commented on is, is not an art audience. It's an audience that responds to emotion. It's an audience that will get up and clap or cry. And that never happens uh, in an art gallery. And so I think, uh, you know, he's, he now says that he wants to make art, um, you know, that will be more cinematic or to give that, you know, uh, impression <laughs> to someone. Um, you know, so it's, it's really been interesting sort of following um, how their lives have changed as a result uh, of the movie. So, Lydia, can you talk a lot about your role and what drew you to this work and to Zach? Sure. Um, I, um, I mostly produce, um, in a documentary crowd, I'll say scripted fiction films <laughs> <laughs> um, because docs are dramatic and narrative. And so... Um, but um, I, had, I had just finished um, producing a film with Wes Anderson, Darjean Limited, and I came back to New York, and a mutual friend introduced Zach and I, and um, Zach had been filming for about a year. Weren't you working together on the same floor or something? Well, oh. after we okay. met, and after we decided to work together, Zach moved into my office. Okay. <laughs> so then we were on the floor for together. <laughs> yes, he hasn't left. Um, but, <laughs> but I, you know, he sent me some footage. I, I looked at it. Um, I was, you know, it was all in Japanese. None of it was translated. Jack, Zach had been filming for a year, often not understanding what they were saying, but just relating to the characters emotionally, I think. Um, but I thought the cinematography was exquisite. It was just, it just, you know, it, it was just shot so beautifully. And the artists were so charismatic, and they were just, you know, they, they had that screen presence. And there was an authenticity to their world and their life. They lived in the moment. You could see that there was something very aspirational about whatever was going on. And we weren't really clear what was going on, I think. And that was part of what Zach was looking for, some... Um, Sanity point. <laughs> well, I, I think like wanted you know a partner that could help figure out the structure for the film because at that point I think there was about 300 hours, so we um, we found two editors um, who w who were a couple. One spoke Japanese and one was American, and um, we began a process of sort of bringing that footage down to about 10 hours and having some of it translated, subtitled, and really looking for the story because Zach had started thinking maybe it was going to be a short film about Ushio, you know, in his action boxing painting. And I think, I think that um, the process of making the film, you know, in, was a series of revelations. And I think one of the, you know, one of the first revelations was the discovery that that Noriko was doing this comic book series, and it, it, it was something that didn't reveal itself for a long time. And then and Zach came into my office one day and said, you know, she's drawing these comics that's about them. And, well, I said, and we looked at a couple, and then we said, well, let's see more. And I think that this fueled Noriko as well, because she began to, you know, she began to exude more confidence in her role in the situation. And she began to put herself out a little bit more so that when you get to the point where the gallery owner 
is coming to look at Ushio's work, she says, I'd like you to look at my work too. And this is something that, you know, I, I feel like in retrospect looking back, that the film was sort of inspiring her to step up and you see her voice emerging as part of something that's really happening. Um, but I think also the, one of the beautiful things for me in terms of being involved in the film really was um, the way um, you know, Zach approached the craft. And you saw it in so many different ways all the time. Um, you know, uh, he made the bold choice to animate some of her comics, which I thought, you know, wow, for documentary is this is you know bold and it's it's um, different and and yet at the same time it was always there was an essence that was always there, and how could the craft of filmmaking be used to bring that essence forward in a way that um, ultimately I think penetrates in a very deep emotional way, and. Um, so it was very interesting to, you know, to be able to support this process with Zach. And I think the, the other part of it that I personally really loved and really loved the process of was the music, which I think you should say something about the music because I love the way you talk about it. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, the composer is Yasuaki Shimizu. Um, I was originally looking for a New York based, I'm, I'm based in, we're based in New York, um, composer. Um, and for whatever, for whatever reason, my sensibility in music uh, has always been more minimalist and, and kind of sparse and, and a bit sadder in tone, to be honest. Um, and I heard uh, a friend of mine had sent me this CD called Pentatonica from Shimizu. And Shimizu uh, lives in Tokyo, um, is in his 60s, was a member of YMO and the Orb, which were these kind of experimental electronic groups for, out of London in the 70s. And, um, you know, had really never done scores. Uh, was you know had, has, has probably recorded over 20 albums and is a, uh, certainly a champion in, in um, Japan and came became famous um, internationally for kind of reimagining the the uh, Bach cello suites uh, with saxophones, um, which seems odd. Um, but uh, there's a quality to his music that's kind of both. Um, very rhythmically challenging, but also whimsical and playful at the same time. So I put the music with some of these scenes um, that at first kind of seemed a bit morose in tone, and and all of a sudden the sort of the the humor and and kind of playfulness, um, you know, kind of was was coming out of these scenes in a way that I hadn't seen, but also maintained this kind of severity and and the drama and and uh, you know complicated nature of the relationship at the same time. So it was one of these things where, you know, you could never have kind of imagined what a very, very specific and bold, um, you know, and very unique music choice combined with, with something that had already kind of established its own tone would create something, you know, new as a result instead of really kind of trying to uh, do that process myself and, and really, you know, uh, it, it, it turned into something that I hadn't expected, but um, I got the, the opportunity to go over to Japan and work with Shimizu for mm -hmm. two weeks after about six months of working over Skype. Um, and his wife is, is this Italian woman who acted as translator, and um, on these Skype calls, the two of them would, would bicker and kind of <laughs> argue over how to <laughs> translate um, what we were talking about, much like the subjects of the film. <laughs> Um, so it became this meta, meta documentary. But. Uh, so Sunday night, both of these artists are coming. Is there yeah. anything unusual about what they might wear or? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, they are kind of fundamentally unusual. So everything uh, that they do, I think, um, has a certain charm, but Ushio, actually, the story between U Ushio's outfit is that uh, he came from a very poor, modest um, background in, in Tokyo, and he sold his first painting um, in, I think, 1960 or 61, or his first big painting, and he went out and bought a tuxedo uh, for the opening, because um, he thought he needed one, and, and that same tuxedo still fits him uh, 50 years later, so that's what he's wearing. Um, and uh, Noriko picked out a very kind of funky dress, multicolored, um, and, and she'll be sporting her 
pigtails. Uh, so I think they're gonna, you know, they'll, they'll be quite the, the sort of um, interesting uh, thing to to witness on on the red carpet with all the other, uh, you know, celebrities and yeah. Okay, great. Okay, Richard and Jeremy, can you introduce yourselves and introduce the film? Um, I'm Richard Rowley, director of Dirty Wars. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm Jeremy Scahill, I'm a journalist, and uh, I guess my title is I'm producer of Dirty Wars. So, um, I guess the introduction is uh, to the film is, you know, I became a war reporter um, when the Iraq war began because I thought it was the most shameful moment in American journalism in my lifetime. Um, not just the echo chamber that led to that war, but the way the embedded coverage that, uh, that characterized it. I mean, we saw that war. Um, we saw it filmed from the noses of bombs, and we heard it narrated to us by, by former generals on cable news. And the cameras were never allowed to go to the other side of that whole media and military apparatus and show us how people live the war on the ground every day, the Iraqi civilians uh, who, who experienced it. And so I became a war reporter and went over there and tried to do the only thing I knew how to do, which was go and tell the stories of the civilians who were living the war. Uh, and I met Jeremy through this process, and we became quite close because we were both covering that war, and like everyone I know who tried to do that, uh, it was an incredibly traumatic experience, and we sort of made it through because we had each other to support each other through it. Um, so we had been tracking over the last few years uh, a process um, you know, in Iraq and Afghanistan where a covert war was eclipsing a conventional war. Um, I'd be embedded uh, in, with Marines and Marge or wherever, uh, and you'd see, you know, you'd go on meaningless presence patrols during the day where your only purpose was to try to get shot at so you could return fire or find you know, target locations for later, uh, working on development projects that were all uh, a waste of time, that all collapsed. Uh, and then at night, hearing about, hearing about these night raids, uh, where uh, these daring raids where Taliban were being killed and captured, but by units that we had no access to. Uh, we couldn't interview their commanders. Uh, we couldn't embed with them. Uh, we couldn't get anything more than a few lines in a press release about what was happening. So when we began this story, uh, Jeremy and I thought this would just be, you know, a, a, I mean, maybe a print article for a magazine, maybe a short film for television about in Afghanistan how this covert war was eclipsing a conventional war and what that meant, the implications of that. Um, but what we found was, uh, I mean, the story of this family in Gardez and a night raid that went particularly wrong, uh, where uh, two pregnant women were killed, uh, along with a, a, an Afghan police officer um, uh, and, and a, another two other people. Um, and there was a cover-up where the bullets were dug out of the bodies of the women and the family were blamed for murdering their own daughters. Um, at, and at the end of this investigation, we discovered that the units responsible for this were not part of the NATO command in Afghanistan. Uh, they were part of, the, uh, of JSOC, the Joint Special Operations Command, this elite uh, covert force that is uh, responsible directly to the executive wing and that operates globally. Uh, is supposed to go after the you know, most high-level strategic targets in the world. They're supposed to do hostage rescue missions, or if a nuclear weapon is stolen from the Ukraine, they go and they track it down. Um, and yet they were kicking in the doors on farmers uh, in, in Afghanistan. And so we, um, uh, we began to look into what they were doing in the rest of the world. And so when we started three years ago, when we knocked on the door of a house in rural Afghanistan and started to talk to this family, we had no idea that the story of this family would end up taking us to Yemen and to Somalia and, and beyond. And we certainly never imagined that we would start the film talking to Afghan victims of yeah, US Special Operations Forces, and we would end the film talking to American citizens whose own family members had been killed by the very same units. And also, too, didn't you get very emotionally involved with many of the people when you would go and you would discover the deaths of many of these people and the kind of trust and the openness that brought you in? Yeah. Yeah, I, um, uh, first of all, I wanna just say that it's an incredible honor to be um, among such incredible people. 
uh, in this room tonight. And um, I have great admiration for all of the folks who uh, made the short documentary films and we got to meet them last night and it was really, uh, it's, it's, it's a stunningly amazing um, group of people and I'm just, I think we're all honored to be with each other. But I also want to bring um, other people into this room. You know, uh, filmmakers and, and journalists uh, can be thieves by nature. You know, you steal people's stories and oftentimes you don't look back or, or go back to share with them uh, what you actually did um, with all that time that you took from them and you know, forcing them in the case of our film or asking them to share the most horrifying painful episodes in their lives uh, and I think a lot of people in conflict zones and war zones have just gotten used to the thievery that is international journalism and uh, our, our credit roll in our film is obnoxiously long um, but it's long because so many people um, gave up something to make the film. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm so proud that Sarah Ishak is nominated for a, a documentary short. Uh, an incredible group of very, very brave Yemeni media activists um, made that film possible. And it's the first time Yemen has had a presence here at the, uh, at the Academy Awards. And we have two Arab women filmmakers that have been nominated, one of whom is sitting next to me. You know, we're living in a moment where we have a democratic president who won the Nobel Peace Prize, who is a constitutional lawyer by training, and who is presiding over a global assassination program, and is not only asserting that the U.S. has the right to conduct drone strikes in whatever country it, it pleases or perceives a threat to its own interests, um, but that the U.S. is right to do it. And, and what we tried to do in our film and it was made possible because of brave Somalis and Afghans and Yemenis who, uh, who won't be interviewed on TV stations, whose names don't go down in the history books, but they made this film possible. What we tried to do was to tell a story uh, that we don't often have to confront in our society. Uh, you know, when the school shootings happen in, in Newtown uh, or Virginia Tech, the media coverage of those episodes is incredibly powerful. Why? Uh, because they're telling us the stories of the children that are killed or the teachers that threw themselves in front of a door. I'm sure all of us remember after Newtown seeing the front page of the New York Times with the listing of all of the children who were killed and their ages. And it, it'd be a name and then six, a name and then seven, a name and then six. And, and, and when the Boston Marathon bombing happened, we all heard about the eight-year-old boy who had drawn that beautiful piece poster and it went viral around the internet before he was so savagely blown up. And, 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 and the reason I bring up the media coverage of it is because they're, they're, they're doing what journalists should do. They are forcing us to empathize uh, with the people who we lost and to imagine the future that the children who drew those pictures would have had um, or the lives that they would have led. Um, and their deaths are meaningful and they teach us something about our society. We almost never do that with people who live on the other side of the barrel of the gun of our foreign policy. But you did that in your film. I don't, I, you know, we, we, we tried. I think, you know, the, the, you the, 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 great, the great, you know, anti-war activist priest, Philip Berrigan, who I had the honor to know, he was one of the Catonsville Nine and sort of mm -hmm. this epic uh, defrocked priest who married a nun and burned draft files during the war in Vietnam. Um, when he was dying of cancer at the end of his life, I, I remember talking to him and he said, um, uh, you know what I want on my, on my tombstone? I just wanted to say he tried. <laughs> and I think that's, that's, that's what documentary filmmakers, I don't think any of us believe that our one film is gonna change the world, but we'll be damned if we don't try to change hearts and minds. But I think also what you did, your film did, was really bring us into the lives, into the pain of the people that you filmed. And it was almost like a promise to them that we're gonna find out what happened and we're not gonna leave you and we're gonna come back to you. And that was very powerful 
in Rick, New York Rick and I would travel, would, w when we were traveling around the world together, we, we would, uh, even when we had raised a bit of money to make the film, I mean, we maxed credit cards out. I kind of <laughs> took a grant that was supposed to be for one thing, didn't tell the funder, and kind of put it toward the <laughs> film. We would always stay in the same hotel room. I mean, we really, we had been friends for a long time, but we really became like family, and we would talk, we would stay up on nights when we were supposed to get up early to do a shoot, just talking about um, the responsibility that you have as someone who has entered these people's lives to do, to, to try to bring some justice for them. It's not that you just want to make, put a film out in the, into the world like you're writing a novel. You want justice at the end of the day for the people that you, you worked with. And I, I, would, I would be remiss if I, I didn't say that um, uh, our co-writer, my co-writer and the co-editor of the film, who is so much more than all of that, he was really the person who helped us find a story that we had lost sight of in our own shooting is, is here tonight, and he really should be on the stage with us. His name is David Riker, and he's there tonight. And, yeah. Anyway, so, yeah. Is he coming up? I just, I'm just saying, in a just world, he would be, you know. Well, you know, let's like, make it just. <laughs> well, I, think it's, I think it's okay. He, he, he waved. He's a, he's a shy man. No, well, he's but can we just okay. see him? Can he come up? Okay. Yes. Fine. All right. Just say, just wave, David. There you go. Okay. Well, I mean, one thing. I mean, just before we 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 pass the baton, is um, it it was really easy over the course of making this film to get really depressed and feel like it was worthless and why the hell were we risking our lives in a, in a countries that no one cared about doing us covering a story that no one was debating uh, for a film that you know no one might see in the end, um, and the thing that. Uh, kept us optimistic and kept us going was to think about all the people around the world who risked their lives to help us bring these stories here. Um, not just about their sacrifice, but about the deep faith that that represented in the American people. Um, they believed that if American audiences knew what was being done in their name but without their consent or their knowledge around the world, that it would somehow change things, that it would fundamentally matter to them. Um, and so in those dark moments in Mogadishu, um, we decided that we would refuse to be more cynical about our own country than the, the, our country's victims uh, who risked their lives to have these stories be told. So um, uh, we just you know, want to thank you all again for, for, for allowing us to keep our promises to everyone who worked on this film. Uh, who, who, that we would do everything we could to bring their stories and share them with American audiences and to hold on to the hope that uh, that people around the world have for us, that we can you know, begin to have the national conversation we should have had a decade ago, uh, but we can turn things around. And, and I think that you did that so clearly because as a viewing audience, we really felt the pain of those people. We felt it seeing the dead bodies and then we felt your vigilant struggle to try to figure out what happened and to come back to them and let them know what you had learned, even if it risks so much for both of you. So thank you very much. Okay, the square. Do you want to introduce yourselves and talk a little bit about it? Um, Jahan Nujem, and I'm the director <coughs> of The Square. I'm uh, Kareem Ahmed, and I'm the producer of The Square. Um, I guess, I mean, well, I'm, I met you 15 years ago, right, <laughs> when I made a film called Startup.com. Yes. And I have to say, you know, um, I made my first film with Chris, Chris Hedges and D.A. Pennebaker, mm -hmm. who are incredible yes, filmmakers. Yes, wonderful filmmakers. Um, and were such mentors to me. And they introduced me to this world of documentary where you know, we had this wonderful dinner last night, which was so communal and wonderful. And it just um, reminded me of everything that I fell in love with entering this community of people, of crazy people that <laughs> do everything to get their <laughs> film made and spend years and years. And, um, and I just, so I'm just so honored to be here with all of you guys. Um, so, um, well, I made my first film with them and then um, I think showing Startup and 
seeing how people reacted to character and how you know people will see a film and they want to know about this character and they feel like they're friends with them by the end of the film and they want to know more about them made me want to go um, do that more and also go back home where I felt like people didn't know and weren't friends with you know people from Egypt or from you know from 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 where I come from and so I then made control room at a time when the Iraq war was happening because I desperately wanted to humanize that struggle and what was happening on the other side of the world and um, and then this film and I think also there's also an incredible thing to verite filmmaking where um, when we were making startup.com we would be editing and we were making this film about these two guys who were in the middle of the dot-com bubble, and I would escape down to Penny Baker and Chris's library of films, and they made all these films in the 60s, and you know, I'd put one in, and you'd be in the back of, no narration, you'd be in the back of the car with Bob Dylan and Joan Baez, and it felt like the closest thing you could get to time travel. You felt like you were in that car with them. Um, and I think I wanted to do, be able to do the same thing you know, in Egypt. Um, and this story started for me, obviously I grew up in Cairo, grew up about 10 minutes away from the square. Um, and Mubarak came into power when I was six years old, so um, he's been with us quite a while. Um, and uh, I made a film actually in 2007, I followed the protest movement for a very long time. Um, I made a film 2005 and six. that came out in 2007 um, called Egypt We're Watching You, which was named after a group of three women who were protesting um, at a time when protests would be maybe 20 people in the street surrounded by hundreds of police and all of our you know, cameras would be smashed and everybody would be in jail. Um, and then everybody would go home and nobody would come back. Um, and um, so when January was coming um, of 2011, we were in a time when Tunisia had just exploded um, and in the summertime, there had been this brutal um, torture and killing of a young man in the prisons named Khalid Said, and a Facebook page had been created in his name called We Are All Khalid Said. And it, you know, things were really rumbling in Egypt. But I grew up in an Egypt where you couldn't have a conversation with a taxi driver or somebody on the street about how somebody you didn't know about how you really felt about the political situation. People wouldn't say how they really felt for fear of, of repercussion. So to see the masses coming down and then get attacked and then not go home the next day and stay and be joined by others was the most beautiful thing. And this is why I make films is because I see something beautiful and magical and I immediately want to share it with the rest of the world. And I find characters that I fall madly in love with and I want to share them <laughs> with the world. And so there was... So going down there, it was just this absolutely beautiful moment. And people were saying, um, Khaled describes this conversation, one of our characters of the film describes this conversation he was having at the time with a taxi driver. And this taxi driver told him, look, it's either you take me or you take me and my grandkids and my grandkids' grandkids. So it's better you just take me because I don't want to live in a country full of corruption where we, we don't want to have kids in this country anymore. And that's, I think, how we all felt and why we all wanted to be there. Um, and so that's really how the film started. But, you know, then the climax happened really, you know, Mubarak stepped down in 18 days. It was this fairy tale. And how do you start a film with a climax? Where do you go from there? And then, but then we sort of thought, you know, this is actually where the real struggle is beginning. And the moment I think we really felt this is where things are just, you know, the story has really started, is when Rami, the musician that you see in the film, um, you know, weeks earlier had been heralded as a hero of the revolution and was on every television station. And Mubarak steps down, all the international cameras leave the square, and there's a few people in the square still saying, you know, the secret police is still in place, the rest of Mubarak's government is still in place, and we have, to, we have to stay here and we have to keep working for deep change. And the square is cleared and uh, Rami is arrested and taken to the Egyptian Museum and brutally tortured and not, no coverage of it anywhere. And I 
had pictures of him filmed by Ida, another woman in the film, and I posted them on my Facebook, and friends of mine, educated friends of mine, said, there's no way that the army could possibly do this. And I was like, okay, there's a whole story that is happening here that has to be covered, and we have to stay here and keep covering it. And, and that's, how it, that's how it started. Um, I met uh, everybody who was on our team in the square. Um, I think sometimes the way that you make art sort of mirrors the art that you're making. And um, it was sort of, we were kind of were like, um, you know, this has to be sort of a leaderless film and nobody can be blamed for making it, right? <laughs> it's the same wa reason why the leaderless revolution worked because nobody could be targeted. So we all came together in this square. I mean, when they ask who's in charge, nobody's in charge. Nobody's in charge. We're all in charge. Right. We're all Everybody in charge. and nobody, and, you know, it will keep going no matter what. Um, so... Um, well, that, that's also because of the support of, of a lot of people. And, and I think that one thing I want to... I just want to thank everyone here and, and the audience and, and, for, and the stage for being here because what's happened to, to us, you know, we come from a country where the symbol of power for 5,000 years has been the pyramid. And today the symbol of power is the square. And it's a sea of people who are claiming their rights and claiming the right to, have, to be authors of their future. And their story will be told and will be heard around the world because of all of you. So I just want to thank everyone here for that. And I initially thought Kareem should be a character in the film. So, <laughs> and you'll see why when you have to talk some more. But, he was what I went to the when I went to the square. There was the Brotherhood setting up a stage in the square. There was the um, sort of very lefty stage, and Kareem with other few other people was setting up a stage because we've been living in a political vacuum, and nobody. You know, he said there's got to be a place for people who don't know who, who they're affiliated with to be able to go up and read a poem or whatever. So I start following him with a camera, and I followed him for about two weeks, and then he said, you know, I don't think I want to be a character in this film. Um, but you definitely need a producer, and so he came on as the producer. And so he became a big character in your life, <laughs> helping you, you to get this I mean, together. And, and I think in, in, in what you know, all everyone's been so many. This baton that we were passing is, is so incredible to hear all the different stories and, and, and the way that different co collaborations and have been made. And I think, you know, it, to, to me, it's really what's so powerful about documentary film and, and what so many people in this room are, are doing is it's the ability to hold a mirror to society. And, 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 and celebrating documentary is really celebrating the, those who stand with that mirror, who are willing to hold the mirror to societies as changes happen, to show the beauty and the ugliness as well. And I think that unless we do so as societies, we're not able to, to, to learn for and move forward. And we're allowing an environment where history will continue to repeat itself. You know? so, so many of these films do that in so many different ways, uh, whether it's in the short form or the long form, it doesn't matter. And I think that we need to continue to cherish that because we live in a world today where the interconnected power of humanity can be the authors of the future in a way like we've never had before. And there's something absolutely beautiful about that. You know, when we see today the image that fundamentally shifted Egypt forever, which is the sea of people crowded in a square, millions saying, we will write our future. We will no longer live in a, a world where this, our story's already been written for us. We will be the authors of our future, and we will triumph no matter how long it gets there. And to see that that story can inspire people around the world to stand with them, and, 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 that, and that audiences like you can level the playing field. Because when the story started in Egypt, it was a lonely fight between the, the Egyptian protester versus the Egyptian dictator. But when the world tuned in and the media reported and people like Jeremy were covering and everyone was covering what was happening, it, became, it leveled the playing field because it became a global fight. And when that happened, the dictator fell. And that's the way that we can continue to fight back. And today when we see square after square after square, whether it's in Kiev or Caracas or Tahrir, all starting to, sh to sh look very similar, we know that something fundamental is happening. That people power is rising and saying, we, the people, have the ability to write a better story. And the success of that story is dependent on all of us contributing. So that's you know, something that I think we really need to continue to, to, to help channel those who are holding these mirrors in different parts of the world and trying 
to, to allow for these stories to be told. Uh, you know, in, in our country, in Egypt, uh, the fight is very much still alive today. At, at a time when the army is trying to whitewash history uh, and trying to reset the buttons uh, and say that we're just going to pretend like none of this has happened and go back. The, f the film being nominated for an Academy Award has completely changed the, the it, it's, it's changed the, the entire conversation because this is the first Academy Award in Egyptian history and, and we're a country that loves cinema. Yeah, the wonderful. And, and, and our story will be heard and we've already won because of, of, of the, the way that this film is getting out there now, the way that it's sparking conversations in Egypt and around the world. We just had a screening uh, in Kiev, actually, two weeks ago. Uh, it was unbelievable in the square. The film was translated by the protesters into Ukrainian. Uh, and then they called us back and said, well, actually, it's minus 30 here, and it's kind of cold to read the subtitles. I mean, I know some people in the audience couldn't read it even here. Uh, and so they, they, they dubbed it into Ukrainian, uh, and we released it there, and over 300,000 people have downloaded it in the Ukraine. Uh, wow. And then they came back a week later and said, well, actually, we want it now in Russian because, you know, if we don't get it to Putin, then, you know, it, it, it's not just about the Ukraine. So we've released a Russian version of the film, uh, and they've shown it now uh, in a square in Russia. Uh, and what's unbelievable about releasing stories like these online is that people can join in the conversation immediately. So audiences can go from being audience, audiences to participants and connecting with our characters online, Skyping Ahmed, our main character, who just met for a few moments, and I encourage you to meet further, uh, and, and, and having him speak to those squares. They just had him speak two days ago to the square in Caracas. So I think that something fundamentally incredible is happening, and we're just at the beginning of understanding not only how it's going to impact our story and how we can participate in that story, but how we can continue to hold power accountable. So. Thank you for having right. us. Right, and it's, and it's also too like the piss pussy riots, which you know were in Russia and they just got beaten, and also skyping with them everywhere and hearing their story that we're not isolated anymore, that we can really get our stories out and we can really get there and we can really have some sense of solidarity and action, a call to action, if you may. The successes and failures of these squares is interdependent, and that's what we're starting to see today, you know? And so it's especially because what's, what, what the squares are breaking is, is, is how we also view how change happens, right? So when you start to see these alarm bells that are happening all over the world, you start to realize that it's not just a local fight, it's a global fight, right? And when you start to see that, then you start to realize, like, well, we have to start looking at the global causes of these fights and start to propose solutions for them. And I think that... One of the things that, that we witness happening is that, unfortunately, the media doesn't like the story of change because real stories of change take a lot of time. They don't fit in a column and they can barely fit in a film. Be and, and I think we have to free ourselves from this idea and this world of change's greatest hits, where we see, you know, we see Martin Luther King say, I have a dream. We see Gandhi liberating India. We see Mandela ending apartheid. But we're not willing to spend 20 years in jail with Mandela because that's boring. It doesn't fit into our attention span. And so I think that is, you know, we, that's how, what, how, where we have to shift. And we need to, you know, celebrate documentaries as a way to continue these conversations. Great. Okay, 20 feet from stardom. Hi, I'm, I'm Morgan Neville. I'm the director of 20 Feet from Stardom. And I'm Katrin Rogers. I'm the producer of 20 Feet from Stardom. Let me just say, first off, there should be another seat here for us. We have another producer on our film, Gil Friesen. And uh, this was his baby. It was his initial idea. And he loved this film. And he worked with us right up until a few weeks before we premiered it when he passed away. So, um, you know, this whole experience of the film and how it's been received has been so bittersweet because Gil's not here to, to enjoy it because he would have loved every minute of it, believe me. Gil was a great guy who used to run A&M Records and he was, um, he was retired and he, when I met him, this is how the thing started, he just said, I think there's something interesting about backup singers. And it was only kind of half of an idea. 
And I thought, well, that's interesting, because I've made a lot of films about music over the years, and I know a lot about music, but I didn't know anything about backup singers. I had no idea. And he said, well, let's, let's see if, if this hunch is correct. And you know, I went home, um, I went to the internet, I tried to look up backup singers, I couldn't find anything. And there were no books, documentaries, articles, websites, and it kind of stunned me that there's, there was this thing that we all kind of know about and we've heard them, but it was just this invisible topic. And that excited me because it was something that, um, that was unwritten. And the only thing we could do to figure out what this film would be, before we even decided to make the film, was just to meet backup singers. And we spent several months, right then Kate, and Kate came on board, and we spent three months, I think, um, initially doing 50 oral histories with backup singers. Ultimately, I think we did about 80. And just initially, you know, within days, you know, I knew that there was this incredible story. And what I felt like we'd stumbled upon was a family. And it was this incredibly tight-knit family where everybody knew each other and looked out for each other. And it was, I had so many misconceptions that were completely blown away by the reality of these people when I met them. I was so happy to be wrong. You know, I thought that maybe they weren't as talented as lead singers, or maybe um, they didn't have enough character to their, to their voice. Um, I, I expected them to be more kind of competitive and bitter and all the things that come along with the music industry. And there was none of that. You know, they were just incredibly loving, supporting, supportive people who and were the best. music. And they just oozed music. And they were the best artists that nobody had ever heard of. I mean, it was just like, I can't believe you're this, this good. And um, I realized when I first did this whole batch of interviews, and I said, well, what is the story here? And I kind of picked a narrative, um, which was to me the kind of the real revolution in this world, which was the migration of these voices, largely African-American female voices from the churches into the studios and onto vinyl, and then the various iterations of that over different generations. And um, it was just a story that, um, you know, initially I thought, um, okay, we're making a film about African American women, and initially I thought it might be a really depressing film because um, because it seems tragic that these people are not better known; they didn't have more success. You feel bad for them, and I felt bad for them, and. What I realized early on, and was one of the, the big breakthroughs for me on making the film, was that they didn't want me to feel bad for them. And that they are not bitter because they've all made their own peace with the lives they live rather than the life they dreamt of having, or rather than the life that the music industry or society tells them they should be living. And you realize that for many of them, backup singing is the best thing they could have ever done. You know, it's the saner decision, it's the happier decision. And what I realized kind of halfway through the film was that in a way this was like the most personal film I'd ever made because I found myself identifying so deeply with these people, you know, because I've been making documentaries for 20 years and just their kind of, their humility, their ethos, their idea that the work is its own reward, you know, that um, their pride in the craft. I mean, all of these things, I just, I was right there with them. I just. I loved them, and I loved, I loved what they were talking about, um, and their voices. And their I voices. Mean, you know, I, I every time I was, with, I was constantly trying to come up with excuses to get them to sing anything. Say, so how does that go? Or how, what's the harmony? <laughs> Just because to be in the presence of talent like that is is amazing. Um, and the other thing they do every time, still to this day, when I'm with them, we'll be in an elevator, and a song will come on, and they'll say, "Oh, that's me singing." You know, and it's like, someday we'll be together by the Supremes. And I said, but that's the Supremes. He said, no, it's me. You know, it's like, okay. That's okay. right. And there's also some wonderful anecdotes that many of them told you, too. Uh, Phil Spector's story, uh, Bruce, 
being a backup singer, Bruce Springsteen? Sure. I mean, on a kind of a music level, um, it's kind of like a secret history of pop music. <laughs> you know, you get you get that out of it. And what it's all about is kind of a paradigm shift that goes on in your mind. It's something I did early on, and, and Kate, and everybody working on the film, where you suddenly take the things in the background and try and consciously force them to the foreground. So I had the radio on, I was going through my record collections, I, just everywhere I was discovering backing vocals in songs I'd heard a thousand times and never realized they were there. I never realized the whole song was based on the backup singing. And once you kind of make that cognitive leap, then suddenly you, it just, it's everywhere. And it was not only in the, in the music, but then when we were doing all of our research on the film, uh, we'd call up every archive and said, send us everything you have on backup singers. And every single archive said, we have nothing. And it's not that they didn't have shots of singers, it's just that they're by their very nature invisible. And you know, suddenly once you focus your eye on it, they're, they're completely visible. And I think, you know, what, one thing that's interesting to me is that, you know, it, it's a story of um, these people who are, they're women, they're black, and they're backup singers. I mean, they're disenfranchised on so many different levels, yet, like I said, they weren't um, defeated by that. And that really inspired me. Maybe you could talk a little bit about the Mary Clayton story and, and Mick Jagger. That's well, the, well, the Give Me Shelter story? Yeah. I mean, that's one of those, the Give Me Shelter is a song that's probably, we've all heard it many times. It's one of the most legendary backup singing performances of all time. But um, you don't really, I mean, it's one of these instances where you suddenly hear it anew. So Mary Clayton, I'd found the isolated vocal track on the internet, actually somewhere, and she came for an interview and I played it for her and she had never heard it. And, you know, it just, it sh well, first of all, she explained to me what all the lyrics were, which I never knew. Rape, murder, it's just a shot away. I don't think most people right. knew exactly right. what it was she was singing. And then the story behind it about her going to the studio, getting a call in the middle of the night and going to the studio in a robe with curlers in her hair, doing the song three times so she could get back to her warm bed as quickly as possible. And then when I was able to interview Mick Jagger, he told me the same story. I mean, it fit perfectly. And I said, okay, this, this wasn't BS. This was actually how this, how this went down. And now, you know, when I hear that song, it, it's completely different <laughs> to me, you know, which I love. And I love taking something familiar like that and making you hear it anew, making it you completely, um, you know, transform it in your mind. Right, and I think Mick said, you know, if we didn't have her, it would just be me and me and me and maybe Keith. A little bit of Keith, yeah. Yeah, a little bit of Keith. Yeah. And that Mary in her head said, I am just going to sing something that is going to blow them out of the yeah. water. Exactly. <laughs> and she did. And she did. I think uh, that was the first scene in the film that we cut. Yeah, that was the never, first scene. And we never, <laughs> we never changed it. never touched it again. Yeah. <sighs> I mean, there's one thing, I mean, we were talking about, are we reflecting, uh, as documentary filmmakers, are we reflecting people's stories? Are we, are we thieves? Um, I felt like a caretaker very much on this film. Um, I felt like these people were entrusting their stories to me. Many of them were hesitant about it, um, in part because the music industry, and by some extension being part of entertainment, because I had a camera, you know, just feeling like I don't want to be exploited. And then I think many of them had kind of made their bargain with themselves about their relationship to stardom. And the idea of even talking about these things were, was drudging up these things they'd long since buried. And, you know, it took that, you know, massive amounts of time and trust to get people to open up. And, and I really did feel then like I had this great responsibility and, um, you know, we had to, we had to tell their stories the best we possibly could. And do you feel that um, you have been encouraged by what you heard, and will never look at backup singers in the same way? Oh, and absolutely. also the the political and the racial divide that you may have found. I mean, we these are amazingly inspiring women, and it was really kind of an honor to be able to work with them. Um, and it wasn't always easy. 
the year sometimes difficult. Divas. <laughs> I yeah. was sort you of can a, say it. I became the diva wrangler, I think. <laughs> which we all understand fun. that. <laughs> um, but they taught me a lot. And I, you know, I think from the very beginning, I realized that there was so much to learn from these amazing women. And what did you learn them. being a diva wrangler? We need your help. <laughs> uh, Where to get calamari at midnight and in Utah? Utah. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you should, uh, I think mainly that you have to have really thick skin. <laughs> And uh, that you, you know, don't take anything. Just put your foot down. Stand up for yourself. Mary Clayton always told me I always had to have my nails done and my hair done. <laughs> Which, um, and, you know, just stand up for yourself and speak up for yourself and, you know. Go for it, right? And not be afraid right. of them. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, they're, um, I mean, even over, you know, they have the, that kind of exterior. Um, but like I said, it's once you get past that, which you get past very quickly, um, they are so loving, so supportive. Um, and I've, I've told this before that, I mean, they would call me many of them would call because many of them are, they almost all came out of the church. And I think the church was actually perfect training for them, not just for harmony singing, but for the kind of psychological makeup you need, the idea of serving something greater than yourself. And I feel like they learned, understood that by coming out of a church setting. Um, and many of them were, they called themselves PKs, preacher's kids. Um, but they would call and say, we're praying for you, Morgan. We're praying for the film. We're praying you're going to tell our story the best way. I mean, I, this went on for years. I was I, they would tell me this all the time. And I'm pretty sure it's the most prayed over documentary in history <laughs> at this point. So um, I've got to give credit to them for that. You know. I just have uh, one last question for you, which was what about the um, archival rights and the music rights? Was that difficult for you? I mean, it was. Um, Yes, it was difficult. <laughs> uh, that's a quick answer. Uh, from a rights perspective, it's about as difficult as a project gets. Mm -hmm. um, we had a few things working for, for us. One was that Gil had been in the industry for so long and knew so many people, and I'd done so much in the music world that I knew a lot of people. And we realized very early on that we had one great tool, one and only great tool working for us, which was guilt you know, which we used mercilessly <laughs> on everybody. Um, and Gil would always take people to lunch because he said they couldn't say no to him at lunch. And he would hit them up and say, okay, we need you to do this for us. We need the song, we need this footage, we need this interview. And, you know, once we got a beachhead with enough people saying yes, then we could really use the guilt on everybody else to hit them over the head. And so we had uh, like 30 tracks from a million different publishers. Yeah, it was <laughs> it was tough. Uh, are there any last words by anyone before we end this brilliant night? I just wanted, I think everyone here probably has so many people, w part of our teams that are in the audience. So I think anyone who's been a part of these five films, please stand up now yeah. because. Yay. Yeah. Remy, Remy. Yeah, these films take villages or squares to make, and um, sorry, but they do. They take teams of people, and you know we're honored to be representatives. But there's so many people back home in Cairo, and I know this whole group has teams that we're so thankful for. And I just want to say to all of you that your films have moved me and influenced me, and. I, for one, will do anything to talk about them, to get them out there, and I wish you all great luck on Sunday. Thank you.